through. The book of Hebrews. <clears throat> Chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1. Chapter 2 and verse 1. The Bible says, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Let me see. It. We should give a more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. I want you to think about this. Every one of us has a certain amount of the knowledge of God in us now. We ought to be adding to that every day. And not let that that we have slip, is what he's talking about here. Not fall back, not backslide, not stay moving forward. But I want you to reckon what you have already, what you do already know, what you do already believe, what you do already uh, have overcome and have a good handle on as far as your relationship with God. Uh, and keeping His Word, and, and, and keeping His commands, and, and living by the book. Uh, those, those things, I want you to uh, make an account, make a reckoning of what I already do. Uh, what makes me different than I was? Now that I belong to God, now that I'm a child of God, could I have I got a list? Could I compile a list of things that God has changed about me, uh, that I know about me now, uh, that I've changed by God's grace, that I know that I'm working on, do I have a working list that I'm constantly trying to add to, and not only constantly trying to add to the working list that I have, but being aware of the things that I do have. I, I want to make about five or six statements of things that you need to be warned about uh, as God's people. Because I don't think a lot of times we get too comfortable in our relationship with God. We get too mundane, too, you know, just, well, whatever goes, goes, whatever happens, happens, and we think that we don't have any power over it. We do have a lot of power over especially our own lives. Uh, first off, what it changes about us. Uh, what knowing God changes about us. There should be a drastic change going on in you every day. Because listen, the world out there that don't know God, that don't want to know God, they got nothing going on. But we can't claim that. We can't say that as the child of God. We ought to be in a constant, perpetual change always. And I know nobody is begging me. Nobody likes change. But God expects us to change every day and prepare. This world's changing all the time. And I know God doesn't change. And I'm not talking about compromise. I'm talking about being aware, am I still effective? Am I still usable of God? Is God getting the best benefit out of me that He can get? And we need to be aware of that. Because it's not just about you. You're, you're, listen, if the whole thing blows up today, you're going to heaven. 99% of the people out there are not. And you could have bearings on that. You could do something about that. You could change that percentage. If you stay aware of what God has done for you, and you stay aware of what's going on and how much more do I need to change but I want just like I said five or six statements here I want to make some dangers that you're, that you're facing just serving God just going on in your life and I want you to, to, to check these things and see where you're at first off like the Bible said 
in this verse, there's a danger of drifting like a ship <coughs> without a rudder. Out of control, not in any particular destination set. Just mosing around, losing your course, getting off course, becoming comfortable with what you have, claiming it, that that's enough, that's enough of God, and, and you've come far enough for, 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 for God's sake and for your sake and your relationship. I, I want to encourage you to remember you can drift right off course Listen to me. Put your Bible down a week. Two weeks. Skip church twice. See what I'm talking about. Those of you that have practiced that or have experienced that in, in, in the past years, you'll have to admit it don't take long for the world to just seep right over you. And before you know it, you're no longer tugged by the Holy Spirit as often. You're not in that consistent relationship with God anymore. It kind of don't bother you now. You better be careful of drifting off course like a ship without a rudder. Not, going, not knowing where it's going. And when the devil finds God's people just drifting, boy, he takes advantage of that. See, he'll put a current in the water that you're not aware of, and he'll push you in a direction that you had no intention of going in, but you just weren't guarding against it. And here he goes, pushing you real slowly in his direction, and it won't be long that you'll be over here so far from God that you can barely hear his voice, and you can barely know what's going on in your spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's a fact. Every one of us, if you've been saved very long, have experienced that. But I just want to remind you, I just want to warn you. Remember, if you don't stay consistent, and listen, I, I want you to put this on your list as part of the minimal things that I do. The minimum the, the, the very least that I could do was to be in God's house every time the door's open. And many of us have claimed that as it's some big chunk, a bigger chunk of what living for God is than God sees it. God doesn't see it as that big of a chunk of being in His will. He expects every one of us to be in and out uh, when the doors are open, uh, when the Word is preached, when it's gathered together. God expects you to be itching to be somewhere uh, where His people are, uh, where the power of the Holy Spirit uh, is manifest, uh, where, where you can make a connection with God. He expects you to be constantly moved to do that. Well, he, he expects, uh, as far as it, it, maybe not in you, but in me, uh, about Monday night, Tuesday morning, I kind of get a itch towards Wednesday evening. I kind of get a, you know, I kind of get a burden to see what God's going to do or, or I kind of get a burden to, uh, to move in God's direction uh, about Tuesday. Uh, you know, and then by Wednesday morning, I'm ready to go. I, I'm ready to, to get what God has for me. I, and I hope that you're at a church now uh, that I don't, and I think God never will, but I don't, or the church don't let you down. That you get something when you come. And there's something added to your relationship with God. You can go away saying, you know what? I'm telling you, I can use that. I can use that starting tomorrow. I can put that into practice. You need to watch and make sure you don't begin to drift away from God. Because the devil will take advantage of that. Number two is this. You need to watch the danger of having an evil heart of unbelief.
God inventories your life every day. And He is prepared to provide what you need on an hourly, on a minute by minute basis. He's prepared. God has done inventory on your life. He knows. Now listen. If you're moving forward and not getting a victory where you've tried to get a victory before and you're trying to get a victory now and you're trying to get deliverance now and you have to keep moving off away from it and satisfying yourself without getting victory, you need to step back a minute and look. Remember, God had a conversation with you about that issue. He said, well, God only God paid attention to me. Oh, boy. I, I, I beg to differ with you. I, I'll argue with you because God does know what's going on and God does provide the strength and the help and the courage and the power to do whatever it is you're facing. You have to stay close enough in relationship with Him to catch it. He speaks to you on it. He, he guides you on it. He answers you all the time. All the time. And you have to say, you know, you say, well, what do you why would any of us have an evil heart of unbelief? Well, because we're human. But when you say I don't have that, well, how come is it that you haven't moved forward then? Did you believe God? Did He send deliverance? Did you take advantage of it? Are you in tune with Well, what's wrong then? There must be some unbelief there. Well, God can't. That, that, there, see there. There is nothing God can't do. So you have to, you have to discard that explanation. It won't work. God can do everything. God will do anything that you ask. If it's in His will, if it'll help you serve Him better. If it'll draw you closer to Him. If it'll help your relationship. If it'll strengthen you. If it'll change you. If it'll deliver you. God's all on board. He's all for it. So don't let or don't pass off too many things that God has shown you that He wants you to get rid of or change or do whatever with and accept, well, that's just the way it is. Well, that's just not the way it is. You need to get a clearer picture of what God's doing in your life and if He's really answering you. The danger of having an evil heart of unbelief. Here's another one, and I think it is probably one that is more present than any of the other ones that I have listed. A danger of being content. A danger of being content with spiritual immaturity that you haven't arrived yet. Well, you're not going to arrive this side, this side of glory, but you're going to make some leaps and bounds forward in your relationship with God. And if you can't recognize, if you can't count those things, if you can't point those things out, if you can't use those things in your life, you need maybe to check up and be aware of the danger of becoming spiritually immature is okay. I, I'm satisfied with it. I don't have to read the Bible. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm saved. I'm going to church. Pay my tithes every now and then. Do a little bit for the church. Take a position. Do a booth at the fellow. Hey, I'm, 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 I'm right up there. What that dangerous thinking. That dangerous thinking. Where you're at with God needs to be a priority in your life and how God works and how the economy of God works and all of that needs to be of utmost importance to you because until you get that down, God can't consistently deliver in your life. Number four is this, another danger. A danger of serious backsliding or failing 
to repent. Well, I'm saved. Yeah, then your life is going to have to be full of repenting. All the time. All the time. And God does not give you a pass. God does not allow you three favorite sins that you don't have to repent of. That you don't have this and you have to ask God, well, I quit doing it. Yeah, you did? Great. Did you repent? Did you ever talk to God? No, I just I just kind of stopped doing it and I think I'm... You, you better talk to God. You better talk to God because it ain't going to take care of itself. And you're going to have to repent of it. You're going to have to repent of it before God moves the power of it out of your life completely. And, and I think that's something that's very serious. We let too many of our sins get stacked on our wagon and think we can just continue on pulling our wagon and leaving those without repenting for them. I'm telling you, the weight of them before very long will bog you down and you don't even know what's going on and it's unrepented sins. It's things that you've never talked to God about. It's things that you've never helped, never asked God for help with and your wagon has gotten too full of thinking about the, or, or, or letting things slide that you think God has done got over. God's done forgot about that. God's done, no, no, he hasn't. No, he hasn't. So, in inventory in my life, as I make a checklist, I wonder how many times and how many lines the word repent, and I repented, and I repented, and I repented. How many times is that going to show up on your list? And if never, you might need to back up and rethink that list. Backsliding and failing to repent. Something I believe is it clogs up the relationship line with God. It gets it clogged up and, and that's not flowing like anymore. And the power of God is not being channeled up to your life anymore because you have so many things that you have not dealt with, that you have not repented of, and they've built up too big. Number five, I guess, would be this. A danger of committing deliberate and willful sins. Well, I wouldn't do that. All of us do it. When we begin to sin willfully, we are getting in another realm of relationship with God than we're used to. Because God, when, now listen, a slip up or a mistake or whatever here is looked upon much different, unless the sin ain't going to slip up on us much. If you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, and He reminds you, and He throws the switch, and He sets the alarm when it does, but there's not going to a lot of it built up. But I want you to think about this. Sometimes I have sins in my life that are deliberate. There are things that I willfully do that God's not pleased with. And we're supposed to be, and you see how busy you would be. And just, just see it, look at how busy you would be if you were following this message that you're here tonight in your life every day. If you were watching about drifting, watching an evil heart of unbelief, watching that I don't come become content with spiritual immaturity, watching that I don't get okay with backsliding, watching that I don't commit deliberate sins, just those five areas would keep you so busy with your relationship with God, you wouldn't have time to sin. You wouldn't have time to get involved in things that you don't need to, and I'm not through yet. The danger of being thoroughly careless and undisciplined in my life in your life. 
when you become careless, when you let discipline slip away, when you say, you know what, man, I was, I was doing that. You know, I had it down every week. I was going through the whole week. I was getting some Bible in. I was getting some prayer time in. I was getting some alone time with God. I was getting some meditation. I was getting some praise and worship. I was getting, I had a pretty good salad of, of all the things God intended. I had a pretty good variety of the things God demands of me. And then I let them begin to start to drop off one by one. And I, my discipline the lift began to slack a little bit. And I said, well, you know, I really got to get to work. And, you know, if I stayed in bed 15 minutes longer, I'd really be, you know, ready to go for today. And I mean, I can put off that morning Bible study. I mean, I can catch that probably at lunch, you know. And you don't get it at lunch because it took them longer to fix the sandwich than you thought. You don't have time to do it. And you know by the time you get home in the afternoon, your house is so crazy. You're not going to do any of it then. You've got too much to do before time to go to bed. And then there you go, a whole day done gone by. And you're satisfied with, well, I didn't do any of that that I did for God today, but I'm going to double up tomorrow. And you'll get to Friday and you'll say, you'll be done. Well, I done got to doubled up and tripled up and quadrupled up. And, and all, I, 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 well, I tell you what, I'm just going to mark this week off and start again. Because I got so many times that I decided that there was something else more important. That I've got so much banked up against me now that I'm just going to have to let that go. Which you may have to do that and God is willing to do it. And God will give you and help you. But we shouldn't let those things. That's a lack of discipline. And then one more. We'll find a place to close. One more. The danger of refusing to hear the Word of God. I know because several people have talked to me about it. I know I have preached some messages in the last month and a half or two months that you were challenged to make a change in your life. And some pretty good challenges on your life were made. And my point is a danger of refusing to hear the Word of God. There's a lot of difference in just hearing it and hearing it and doing it. Hearing it and doing it is a long ways apart. It's a long ways apart. Just hearing it isn't anything like hearing it and doing it. Hearing it and agreeing with it is not hearing it and doing it. So, hearing it and not doing it is a refusal to hear the Word of God. And that's a dangerous place to put yourself at as a child of God. If you look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 18 through 26, it kind of shows you. And it's all, this was all chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 2 and chapter 3. You're going to pick up most of everything that I've talked about. Chapter 2 and chapter 3 in the book of Hebrews. It carries just on from one point to the next that I've made. But there is a difference, like I said. And if you get used to coming and hearing it, agreeing with it, and not doing it, that's the way your life's going to go. That's the way your life's going to go. And anybody ask you about it? Yeah, we got some great preaching at Vision Baptist Church. Yeah, we heard a good message this week. Yeah, there were some things in there that, boy, I really, you know, was challenged by. Yeah, but I didn't do any of them. I agreed with them. I, I, I amen it. I said even in my own spirit that that was a good thing and a good thing for me to be challenged by. But I'll be honest with you, out of everybody in the room, 
The possibility is that nobody did it. Nobody did it. And it's not because I'm a good preacher or a bad preacher. <coughs> what I do is preach the Word of God, try to challenge you with as much as God shows me to do, and then you have to, listen, if I preach something that you agreed with and was in conflict with the way you're doing now, but you agreed with the principle that was preached, and that, hey, I should listen to what I heard and make a change, but didn't. That is you, not you refusing to do what I say, but refusing to hear God and do what He says. But God never fails to let you hear it. God does get it to your ears and to your heart. He has no power over what you do with it then. But He makes sure that you get the message. That, and, and I say this a lot of times. When I preach, it's not for those that's not here. It is for those that are in the room. And all of us should be doing what we hear preached. Not only agreeing with it, that's great. I mean, that's great that you agree with it. But it doesn't help you if you don't do it. If you don't make that change. I know, and I know very well that God has made unbelievable changes in many, many, many of the lives that are in this room. It is due to the preaching of the Word of God. Not me, but the Word of God, the power of the Spirit, and all the things that God adds to it to get the message to you. And I know you can attribute all of these things that have changed in our life and that we've overcome and that we've put behind us and that God has been blessed because of, you can put those on that side of positive things that's happened to me through my relationship with God and in my relationship with Vision Baptist Church. But just think, if I could move from this side of the list, all the things that I heard, I agreed with, and said I would start to work on, if I could move those to this side of the list, man, what God would have done with me by now. What would God have done? Listen to me. God, I've got about three minutes. God has an expectation of the, this group of people. He believes that there are to be a couple of Billy Sundays, a couple of John R. Rice, a couple of Billy Graham, a couple of the, a couple of powerhouse preachers and professors of the, of the truth that come out of here. That was his, well that was, that's God's plan. That's what God, that's God's expectation. And you know, he thought it would have happened after three years and after five years and after 10 years, and after 15 years, and after 20 years, how much longer should we expect God to wait before He moves on?
puts us on the shelf and says, you pretty well leveled out right there, and I'm going to leave you on the shelf. I have a group of people that I can preach to and that I can expose my word to and reveal myself to that I think is going to do a mighty work for me and I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. I'll leave a little tug of the Holy Spirit and I'll always hope that somebody will pull ahead and do what God expects me to do. I would just love to be able to pull up B.J. Willis on, on my spiritual computer screen. You know, I had one of them, didn't you? My spiritual computer screen pull up B.J. Willis and look and see if God had His way in B.J. Willis' life and every time that he made a proposal and B.J. gave in to it, where he would be now. I was just, you know what I'm saying? Like, they had this computer program where you can get lost or kidnapped as a child and they can do like a program of what you would look like now 20 years later if they, you know, had done that program on your face and they started with you as a child and what you would, you know, what you would look like 20 years from now. I see like that had people that got lost or missing kids, you know, and been missing for 30 years. It's all we have is that infant uh, picture of it. But the best program we have uh, computer-wise and we start doing it on, I wonder what BJ would have accomplished by now. And you take BJ name and put it on anybody and everybody, including me in this room. And if we can look ahead and look and see what God could see, I wonder what, say, okay, 20 years, I have closed. 20 years, 20 years, I've been here. Let's give it another 20 years. 20 years. And if God blesses, I'll still be here 20 years from now. I would like just a flash of where Donnie's going to be, where Seth's going to be, what God is going to be able to do with Seth and Jess in 20 years. We have an awesome God. He has, he has an imagination that we can't even imagine. Just think about it. I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot. But what if, what if you were able to look ahead 20 years ahead in your life and see what God, listen to me, and I'm not talking about 20 years and, and whatever happened. I'm talking about 20 years of God's will being accomplished all the way. 20 years. If you don't even know about it yet, I don't even know. You know, But 20 years ahead, and you not even know, and just see what God could do with somebody like you. Listen to me. He done more than I could imagine he could have done with me in 20 years. Oh my God, what he done in 20 years. What could he do with you, Will, in 20 years? If he surrendered and said, God, you just do whatever you want to do with me. I'm game for it. I'll, I'll go. Send me, Lord, and I'll go. What would happen in 20 years in your life? Let's stand. Father, we close. When we open up the altar, God, I, I ask you, Father, to just give us a little shake. Remind us, God, that you have a great expectation and you have all the power in heaven to make it come true. God, you got such a plan written for me, for BJ, 
for Donnie, for everybody in this room. You've got such a plan written. It's a done deal. It's already laid out, God. And it's our choice to take it. You'll grant us power and strength to accomplish that that you want accomplished with our lives. God, we've seen it over and over in your word where you took the nobodies and made them a somebody. Lord, I ask you to take a nobody like me and turn me into a somebody, God, that you could be proud of. And I ask you to put a burden in every person's heart in this room to do just that. To figure out what it is and don't ever back up from it and continue to move forward. Folks, be getting saved every service. Church will be growing unbelief. God, you have your way. That's what we want. We want your will done. So Lord, you have your way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.